Thou wouldst think it strange, but there was a time when a civil war ripped this nation apart, setting friend against friend, cousin against cousin, father against son. The year is 1642. War is declared between Charles I and his parliament. And so England joins Scotland and Ireland in a civil war which would last over a decade and claim the lives of a tenth of the population. Why? What caused such conflict? They are father and son, the Vernies, Edmund and Rafe. In 1642, Edmund died fighting for the king. Rafe supported Parliament. But two years earlier, in 1640, they weren't so divided. They'd gone to London together to sit as members of Parliament, both well aware of the problems the country faced. Well, my boy, we take our seats together. You'll like Parliament. Much talk, much gravity. Uh, but this being your first time, perhaps it's best you keep quiet. Mm, breathe it all in, you know. Because you would not have me criticize the king. <laughs> You're so obvious, father. But no, I will not sit as some dumb animal. For we have great work to do in this parliament, and I will play my part. You're really too soft on the king. Do you not think it's time we hauled him over the coals? He doesn't haul a monarch over the coals. Well, his advisers, then. You do admit he has bad advisers. You do admit his policies reek somewhat of stale fish. He's my king. I've served him for 30 years. I know, father, and he's your friend. Good. But isn't true friendship to help a man when he's down, even if that means a little pain? And so it is with a king. He needs experienced men to help him through these troubled times. Parliament must seek out a new role. We must take from the king control of the army. We must choose for him new and upright ministers and punish those that led him astray. It's for his own good like medicine forced on a sick child. King Charles I believed, as his father had before him, that he was appointed by God and that royal authority should never be questioned. Kings are not only God's representatives upon earth and sit upon God's throne. But even by God himself, they are called gods, for they have a kind of divine power upon earth. Charles wasn't so unusual. Kings all over Europe believed in their God-given right to rule. So why should MPs argue that Parliament should be more involved in the running of the country? The problem lay, perhaps, in the character of Charles I. He had nothing of faith, truth, justice, or generosity in him. He was the most obstinate person that ever was, and bent upon being an absolute, uncontrollable sovereign. He had an excellent understanding, but was not confident enough of it, which made him follow the advice of men who did not judge so well as himself. Charles appeared dependent on this small circle of advisers. For 11 years, he'd refused to call a parliament. But problems were beginning to emerge. Appalled by changes in the church, an army of Scots rebels had invaded the north of England, and Charles faced financial crisis. He's like a creeping schoolboy that can't look after his pocket money. It just falls through his fingers. I lent the king a tidy sum myself once, never saw it back. But at least a loan is better than a forced tax. He's been stealing money for years, and then, insult to injury, he fritters it away. Oh, I wouldn't say steal. Well, I would say steal. Parliament votes in taxes. Always has, always will. It is our unquestioned right. Yes, we thought so. And yet you let him rule 11 years without you. We didn't let him. He chose not to call us. We are, after all, merely the King's Parliament. I can understand there being no Parliament called if there be no need for Parliament. <laughs> but the King was bankrupt. It was only right he called us. Instead, he goes it alone twists old taxes, invents new ones. No. We will pass a law, set the rules in stone. From now on, Parliament will control the public purse. Westminster Hall, the ancient seat of Parliament. John Pym, a leading critic of the King, outlines the problems as he sees them. I shall explain to you the grievances that afflict the country. Firstly, the absence of Parliament for 11 years. 
Secondly, Archbishop Lord's reforms in religion. And thirdly, how the King has sought to raise taxes without debate in Parliament. The solution is simple and must start with the removal of the King's advisers. November 1640. Thomas Wentworth, Earl of Strafford and Lord Deputy of Ireland is arrested. I stand accused of treason, but there is no proof. You bring forth my enemies and try to make people believe they speak the truth, but they do not. It is not I that have acted against England and my king. It is they that would change the laws to make me guilty. The Earl of Strafford hath tried to ignore the laws of England and Ireland and to set up his own government. For a man to have such power is dangerous for the king's person and dangerous for the crown. Strafford's rule in Ireland had been tough, efficient and backed by an army. Parliament feared that Charles planned the same for England. Strafford had to be got rid of. The House of Commons have found Thomas, Earl of Strafford, guilty of high treason by 204 votes to 59. He shall therefore be put to death. Angry mobs rioted in the streets demanding Strafford's head. The king, fearing his family's safety, signed the execution warrant and so betrayed his closest advisor. I beheld on Tower Hill the fatal stroke which severed the wisest head in England from the shoulders of the Earl of Strafford. Next on Parliament's list was Archbishop Laud. He was tried, imprisoned, and later he too was executed. Why such ruthlessness? because Strafford and Laud were to blame for the king's problems. But what if the problem lay deeper? What if the problem wasn't bad advisers, but the king himself? Rafe, what on earth has happened? Couldn't reach the chamber for the mob outside. What sort of skullduggery is this? They've passed it, Father. John Pym has scraped it through. His grand remonstrance. All the king's errors, all the king's faults, listed for all to see. But it's not our role. Parliament can advise, humbly, respectfully. It's not our role to tell the king how to behave. Oh, there were many that agreed with you, Father. The house was split down the middle. Members shouting, waving hats, scuffling, some drawing swords. And when the bill was passed, and John Hampton suggested we have it printed and distributed... What? They go too far, your friends, Rafe. Would they tell base stories against their monarch? Stir up the people against their monarch? We are not the king's enemies, Rafe. Our aim is to help him govern the people. This grand remonstrance does not help him. Rather, it merely uses the people to pull him down. Why this change? Why in 1641, for the first time, were there such direct attacks on King Charles? The answer lay not in England, but in Ireland. The frights and terrors we live in here cannot be understood properly by those who do not suffer them. Many are leaving for England that can relate it as eyewitnesses, which you will hear before this letter comes into your hands. Since 1600, huge areas of land in Ireland had been taken from the Irish Catholics and given to the English and Scottish Protestant settlers. Once Strafford's iron hand was gone, the Catholics rose in rebellion, and a stream of anti-Catholic propaganda poured into London. The rebels march on, furiously destroying all the English, sparing neither sex nor age, most barbarously murdering them. The pamphlets mixed fact with fiction and whipped up hysteria. Charles called for an army to put down the rebellion. But this was one of those times in history when events are shaped by confusion and misunderstanding. The rumor spread that Charles actually supported the Irish rebels. It took the king long enough to call those murderers rebels, and then he did so by special proclamation, of which only 40 copies were printed. The king blocked all the Parliament's efforts to help the Irish Protestants. And we, good Protestants of England, observed all this and were much saddened to see our king and queen support such cursed rebels. 
In London, a mob demonstrated outside Parliament. They protested that if Charles were given an Irish army, he'd use it against England. Meanwhile, in Parliament, MPs were split over Pym's attack on the King, his grand remonstrance. Mr. Speaker, when I heard of Parliament's declaration to the King, I imagined we would present to the King the wicked advice of evil councillors. I did not dream we should tell stories to the people and talk of the King as a third person. If the remonstrance had been rejected, I would have sold all I had the next morning and never have seen England any more. And I know there are many other honest men of this same view. These were tense and angry months. John Pym stirred the mob against the king and the king responded in kind. On January the 4th, 1642, he burst into the House of Commons to arrest Pym and four others he'd accused of treason. The cheek of it! The king standing there in our chamber, in full defiance of our ancient rights and privileges. But the five members had flown, thank God. And as he left, uproar. Half the house shouting, God save the king. The other, myself included, shouting, parliamentary privilege. You make me so sad, Rafe. The way you burn so hot and indignant. Parliamentary privilege. I remember when merely to sit in parliament was privilege enough. Now we say it's our right to sit, to govern, to decide how the king will fight his wars, spend his money, as if we would be kings ourselves. I don't know how you can just go on serving this king of yours. This king of mine is your king too. He's not. Not when he will trample on the freedom of parliament. I know, I know he is a fool. And yet I would fight for him because he is my king. Peace between king and parliament looked less and less likely. Parliament's demands became more and more extreme. All affairs of state, including foreign policy, religion and finance, must be agreed with parliament. Both houses of parliament must approve the education of the king's children. His children cannot marry without parliament's consent. For Charles, such restrictions were unthinkable. If these were passed, we may be waited on bareheaded. We may have our hand kissed. But as to true and real power, we should remain just a picture, just the sign of a king. The crisis seemed to grow worse by the day. The king will not accept Parliament's demands. All those who oppose him he calls traitor. I am no traitor, but I have sworn my oath of allegiance for Parliament. It wasn't easy. For in opposing the king, I must oppose all those who assist him. You, father, must become my sworn enemy. It troubles me so, Rafe. I hope to God there will be peace. For truly I want none of this war that sets friend against friend, cousin against cousin, father against son. And I'm so desperate to think of you being on that side. I can hardly bear to think of it. With war approaching, both sides needed money and men. The Queen pawned the crown jewels to raise cash for the King. Charles sent messages to every county, ordering people to support him. Parliament sent messages, ordering them to disobey. Sir Paul Harris sent out warrants commanding all men between the ages of 16 and 60 to appear upon Middle Hill. Those that gathered were told that any person that would serve the king as a soldier would receive 14 groats a week for his pay. This day, the 22nd of August, 1642, the king has raised his standard. We are now at war. It's all so dismal, hardly a fine way to start. Nottingham Castle swept with rain. The herald stumbling over the words of the declaration because the king had rewritten it so many times. And the standard blew over in the wind. The king says he'll send another message to Westminster to ask for peace, but it's too late now. And though to serve my king is an honor, I am heavy of heart. It was a messy beginning. Few responded to the king's call. It was harvest season, and people were more concerned with their crops than with a dispute between king and parliament. Many counties signed pacts of neutrality, but others were forced to declare for one side or the other. I had promised my loyalty to the king, but I was never so great a royalist as to forget that I was a free-born Englishman. I wanted the king, but not as a dictator. 
I wanted to cut the power of the king's advisers. But when it came to king against parliament, I, I did not know what to do. I did not want to fight on either side. As I am loyal to both king and parliament, what reason have I to fall out with either? I want to live at home, in peace. Most people only became aware of the war when their houses and fields were plundered by troops for supplies. Finally, on the 23rd of October, 1642, the two armies met at Edge Hill. My lords and gentlemen here present, if this day shine for us, we shall be happy in a glorious victory. Your king is both your cause and your captain. Now with your swords, declare what courage is within you. Come life, come death, your king will bear you company and always remember this battlefield. I swear by almighty God that if anyone will take the standard from my hand, they must first take my soul from my body. I have a creeping fear that I may not survive this day. But I would rather lose my life than desert my king. It was almost three of the clock in the afternoon before His Majesty's army was wholly drawn up in battle, at which time they marched on with slow and steady pace. As soon as they were in reach of cannon, the rebels fired at them. Shots were exchanged for an hour or thereabouts. By this time, driven back, the enemy's foot soldiers, wherein the King's standard was, came on within musket shot of us, upon which we charged them with some losses. The battle was bloody. The cavalry ran away at the first charge, and men had to struggle with them for three miles. After our shot was spent, we came to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting and fought very gallantly until we were, at last, broken. The battle was the bloodiest, I believe, the oldest soldiers in the field ever saw. The night was as cold as a very great frost and a sharp northerly wind could make it. The frost congealed the blood of the wounded, and many a life was saved. 1,500 men were killed at Edge Hill in just three hours. The country had not seen fighting like it for 150 years. Amongst the dead was Sir Edmund Verney. My father was cut down by an ordinary trooper. He could have saved himself had he given up the standard, but his loyalty was obstinate. After the battle, his body was nowhere to be found, lost in the carnage. They found the king's standard, and they say still grasping it was the stump of a man's hand, my father's hand. I don't know whether to believe the story. I'd like to believe it, for my father was a man of great courage. The war continued for four more bloody years. Who was to blame? The king, parliament, or a series of events that neither king nor parliament could control?